And first up this morning is uh, Dr. Chris Teutsch from Virginia Tech. I'm not going to do a lot of the way of introduction of these guys. They, they know themselves better than I do, I hope. So, <laughs> Chris, you can tell us a bit about yourself and uh, take it away. Thank you, Chad. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, my name is Chris Toich. I'm from Virginia Tech, and I'm located at the Virginia Tech Southern Piedmont Research Station. It's an outlying research station that's kind of south and east in the state. And um, we're 180 miles from our main campus, um, right almost on the border of the coastal plain region and the uh, Southern Piedmont region in Virginia. And I've been working with some of these uh, brachytic dwarf forage sorghums, I guess, since about 2009. And, um, and, and I want to show you some data that we've collected over the years today and, and talk a little bit about how these fit into forage systems. And uh, Tom Kleiser, we've got a great, a great lineup. And please make an effort to come back this afternoon because Tom is going to wrap everything up really talking about using these from a systems perspective. And uh, he's an excellent speaker. Um, <clears throat> I want to start out and talk, you know, uh, one thing that I did want to mention is that our titles don't exactly match what's in the program, and that was just a clerical error. These are the titles that we were actually given, so um, they didn't get updated in the program. Um, I wanted to start out and just have one slide and in, in talk about some long-term weather data that was kind of put together that looked at, at drought in the Mid-Atlantic region. And um, this wasn't put together last year or the year before or even five years ago. This was put together in 1970. It's two years after I was born. And, and what this long-term weather data analysis said was that we can expect a moderate drought one out of every five years in a severe drought one out of every 10 years. Pretty close to what actually happens in the Mid-Atlantic region when you really sit down and think about it. And, and you know what always amazes me is that it's a surprise. You know, it's like we get into a drought and everybody's like, man, we've never seen one of these before. And, but drought is really part of our agricultural landscape. And we need to be thinking about drought all the time and managing our forage systems for drought all the time, just not when we get into a drought, but all the time. And uh, in my opinion, you know, if you're working with producers where you have livestock, you really need to sit down and think about what am I going to do when it gets dry again? And, and how am I going to feed these animals and come up with some kind of a plan? There's a lot of anxiety that goes on when things start to get dry if you don't have a plan in place. Uh, I want to talk about a couple things today. And um, the, the first one is just one slide on water use in agriculture. When I was getting ready for this presentation, I came across a pretty interesting article that I just wanted to share with you a couple highlights. I want to talk about some of the work we've done with sorghum Sudan grasses and Sudan grasses over the years. Look a little bit um, at forage sorghum for silage and some of the work that we've been doing in Virginia. And then just kind of wrap things up by opening it up for questions and, and asking for your comments. And, and, and there is a lot of, of gray area here, so I, I hope we get some good discussion. Uh, I want to start out and talk just a little bit about water use in agriculture. And, uh, this was a kind of a review article that was done by Morrison in 2008. And agriculture accounts for 80 to 90 percent of the fresh water use in the worldwide. 80 to 90 percent, so a huge, huge number. And um, 18 percent of uh, cropland worldwide is irrigated, but it accounts for 40 percent of production. So simply saying, that we can reduce water use by stopping irrigation is not really an option with the population growth that we're seeing in the world today. So, so we've really got to think about how we can most efficiently use that water. And there's always increased competition for water use. We've got population growth, urban expansion, uh, economic development. And this, this increased water use competition is not just happening in arid regions of the world, but we're seeing it in humid regions like the southeastern United States. And, and that's going to be, I think, one of our big issues as we move you know, forward in the next uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years. So we've really got to think about how we can most efficiently use water within, in uh, forage in livestock and cropping systems. And not just irrigation water, but also rain-fed systems. How can we most efficiently use that rainwater? And it's going to come from a, 
I think, from a, um, a number of things. Looking at better agronomic management, so removing things that are limiting yields in production, fertility, pH, uh, choosing the right cultivars are, are all going to be important. Um, using improved irrigation technology, we've got a researcher at our station who's looking at uh, some alternative methods of irrigating tobacco, which reduces water by use by 70%. Uh, and then uh, ultimately crop breeding and uh, looking for cultivars that are more efficient at using water. And, and I just wanted to mention, I put together kind of a summary table of water use efficiency, and I know there's a lot of stuff in there. Don't get caught up in all those numbers. I'll show you what I think is important. But um, this is water use efficiency in different forage crops, and I kind of indexed everything against alfalfa. And we always think of alfalfa as being a really a drought-tolerant crop, and it is drought-tolerant because the morphology of that plant, it's got a real deep tap root, which can find water in the soil, but it's not really efficient at using water. It uses about 844 kilograms of water to produce one kilogram of dry matter. When we look at something like our sorghum species, they use 271 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry matter. So they use about 70% less water than alfalfa would. And, and that's important to consider when we're setting up cropping systems in, in crops for forage livestock systems. We need to be thinking about how much water we're using and what's going to get us the most pounds of dry matter per unit of water used. So let's change gears a little bit. And this is just a, um, a graphical rep representation of the growth curves of our primary pasture base in the transition zone of the United States, which is a fescue clover mix. So we get a hump of growth in the spring, hump of growth in the fall, not much going on in the summertime. Cool season grass growth is limited by temperature during the summer months. So even in years where we have adequate water, we still have reduced production during the summer because of high temperatures limiting photosynthesis. That's kind of where these warm season grasses and these summer annual grasses kind of really fill in because they have the ability to grow at higher temperatures when our cool season grass growth is limited. And that's one of their big benefits. One thing that I want to mention as we go into this symposium is that these summer annual grasses are not some kind of a miracle species. They need water to grow, too. And that's important to remember. If you don't have water, you're not going to get growth on summer annuals either. Where they really have the advantage is that they grow at higher temperatures, and they're much more efficient at using the smaller amounts of water that we have during the summer months. So if we're looking at a dairy system and we're able to irrigate some of our pastures, we're much better off in a summer irrigating a summer annual grass than we would a perennial cool season grass sod. We're going to get more growth response per unit of water used. All right, um, I want to share with you some summer annual uh, variety data that we've been collecting over the last several years. And uh, we've been testing summer annuals at the research station since I came. It started in the early 2000s. But it hasn't been to more recently that we've, we've looked at at digestibility of these summer annuals. So we've always looked at yield, and our old recommendation for summer annual varieties was choose one that you can find at the local co-op that's cheap and, and use that and really focus on management. And, and I think that recommendation has to change as we move forward, and I'll tell you why as, as, we, uh, as we get into this talk a little bit. So we more recently started to look at not just yield but also digestibility. And um, in these trials, we looked at, at sorghum species, so sorghum Sudan grass, forage sorghum Sudan grasses, and uh, pearl millets, and then pearl millets also. And pretty standard management, we gave 75 pounds of nitrogen at seeding and then 60 pounds after each harvest to stimulate regrowth. And, and this was the first set of data that, that came back from the lab. It was the first cutting of the 2009 summer annual variety trial. And um, this kind of really piqued my interest. And, and this was not all the varieties. We had 30-some varieties in the trial. But when I put 30 on there, they're so small nobody can see them. So what I did was pick just a couple from the top, a couple that performed in the middle of the pack, and then a couple at the bottom here. And, um, and we had a forage sorghum. FS is forage sorghum. SS is sorghum Sudan grass. And SG is uh, Sudan grass. And then PM, of course, is pearl millet. And um, most of them had the brown midrib trait that we're showing you here. 
And if you're not familiar with the brown midrib trait, that's a, a naturally occurring mutation that takes place within that genetic sequence of that plant, which causes the midrib of the plant to look brown. That's not the important part, but it causes a, is a lower lignin content of that plant, which increases the digestibility of that plant. So what did you have a question? I, I'm sorry, what was it again? The number of hours of the fermentation, 30. All right, so when we got this, uh, when we started to look at this data for the first time, and, and we looked at the yield data, and, and there was a pretty, pretty big difference in the yield. It ranged from 3,800 pounds up to 6,800 pounds at that first harvest, and that's pounds of dry matter. But what was even more interesting, when I got the numbers back from the lab, was a range in digestibility, 54 to 74% at that first harvest. So a huge range in digestibility. When I saw those numbers come back, I said, well, you know, for sure, the, the ones that yielded more are going to have lower quality because they were more advanced in growth stage when we harvested. And what was interesting, when I started to match those numbers up, you know, some of the highest yielding in the trial were also some of the most digestible in the trial. And that really kind of piqued my interest in this relationship between yield and digestibility. And, and that's what we've been kind of looking at um, over the years uh, since 2009. Now, I'd mentioned um, BMR and, and non-BMR varieties. And, and what we've done is for these trials, we've, we've broken it out and looked at the impact of the BMR trait on the digestibility. And this is in vitro true digestibility. And um, that's when we take dried ground forage material, and we put it in room and fluid from the animal and measure what disappears or what's left over. And, uh, and what we see that when we have a BMR variety, over the years we expect somewhere a difference between a BMR and a non-BMR of three to five percent. So if we just use a BMR variety, we can expect probably about a five percent increase in uh, digestibility of those plants. Now, there's quite a wide range in the values, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, even within the BMR varieties, in terms of digestibility. So, so what we're saying here is if, if you go to the farm store and you buy a variety, chances are you're going to get about a 3 to 5% increase choosing a BMR variety. We also looked at gene number, and, um, and this is uh, in the trials we've had Non-BMR, BMR6 gene, that's the place where the mutation takes place within the genetic sequence, 12 and 18s. Now, to be, to be fair to the 12 and 18s, we haven't had a tremendous amount of those varieties. Most of the varieties entered in the trial have been the BMR6 mutation. But, but when we did, we, we went through and we compared uh, the in vitro true digestibility for the different gene numbers. And, and as you can see, the gray bars, the um, non-BMR types, and they're always lower in each year of the, in each year of the study. Um, not a huge difference between, between most of these, some significant differences, but not a huge difference between most of the BMR 6, 12, and 18. So, so I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that one gene is superior over another, is what I'm trying to say. What I wanted to show you was a, in, with this little table was the range in in vitro true digestibility within the BMR trait and the non-BMR trait. If we look at the bottom line on this table, this is varieties that had the BMR trait. So we had probably on average about a 10% difference in digestibility within the BMR traits. So what's important to remember is that just because you choose a BMR variety doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the most digestible variety. And, uh, and also, I want you to notice, even within the non-BMR varieties, there was a pretty big difference in, in range and digestibility also. So the question is, should we be chasing the BMR trade or should we be ch chasing digestibility within these forage sorghums? And, and we probably need to look at more for more than just BMR. We probably need to look at, at the digestibility of individual, um, individual cultivars. So range quite, quite large. So simply selecting a BMR trait doesn't necessarily mean you're going to increase digestibility. Um, so we need to consider digestibility, and it needs to become part of our routine testing as we evaluate these, these cultivars um, in trials. So 
over the years, I've collected all this data in, in, in just thousands of lines of data of um, varieties in, in digestibility and ADF and crude protein, all this, all this data. And a lot of times when you give people a table like that, they look at it and their eyes kind of roll back in their head and that's the last time they look at it. So one of the things that I tried to do was is put this in a way that people could actually see what was happening. And what we did was I came up with this little um, way of graphically displaying this. And this is indexed yield and digestibility graphed against each other. So on the bottom we have yield, and this is yield difference from average. So a zero on this graph would be the average yield for the trial. Same thing for the digestibility on the y-axis. Zero would be the average digestibility for the trial. And then we ranked all the other varieties in the trial against those averages so we could see kind of where they fell out at. And then we divided this graph into four quadrants. The quadrant down here in your lower left hand corner has, these are varieties that have low digi, av, lower than average digestibility and lower than average yield. Those are varieties that if you're looking to put into a forage program, you probably want to try to avoid. And, uh, and in the upper right hand quadrant, we have varieties that have above average digestibility and above average yield. Those are varieties that you probably want to take a look at in your forage program. And, and we did this, this is 2009, but we've done this each year since, since we started this study, and we've kind of um, picked out some varieties over the years. The first year I did this, you know, everybody looked at this graph and they're like, man, I want to know what the varieties are in the upper right-hand corner. And, you know, one year of yield data, I mean, one year of data is not real good. I, I'm, I'm getting more comfortable recommending varieties with this graph after about three years of data. And, and I want to show you a little bit this year we had a larger number in 2010 in that upper right hand corner, smaller number in 2011. And, and when I kind of went through this graph and I looked at varietal performance, if we looked at two years of data, so average um, in both 2009 and 10, and looked at those varieties that were above average in yield and digestibility, we had four varieties that kind of rose to the top. For two years in a row, they were in that upper right hand quadrant of that graph. Extra Grays, which was a, um, a product marketed by Evergreen Seed, which is now Sentinel Seed, and that's a local Virginia company. In 9301, which is a Sudan grass hybrid from Alta Seeds or Advanta. 6501, it's a sorghum Sudan grass from, from Advanta, and then 22050. And that was for two years in a row, it was above average for both yield and digestibility. When we looked at three years of data, two of those stayed there. And that's 9301 and 6501 from Advanta Seeds. So for three years in a row, they were above average in yield and digestibility. You know, when you get three years of data, you're starting to see varieties come to the top that are pretty robust. And, and that's really what we want to look at as, as we move forward. So in our, variety, in our environment in Virginia, 9301, where we tested these, and 6501 have been had pretty robust performance. So just to kind of summarize this data, BMR trait increased digestibility somewhere around three to 5%. Um, no single BMR gene appeared from our data to be superior to the, to the others. Um, the range in digestibility was great both within the BMR trait and within the BMR gene. Um, so. The bottom line is, I think as we move forward, we need to encourage seed companies to look at not only yield in these trials, but also digestibility within these varieties. And I, I think that's where we need to be moving as we move forward. I want to change gears a little bit and show you some data um, on some sor forage sorghum work that we've been doing in Virginia. And we were just at a dairy farm the other day, and I was taking one of our new dairy scientists around, and and I posed a question to the dairy farmer. I said, what's the single biggest challenge that you face within the system? And he didn't even have to think. He said drought. And, um, and drought's a, a major issue. And uh, especially as we move into the southeastern United States, um, I, I think we have a little more leeway in the Midwest where we have better soils, better moisture holding capacity. But when we get into highly eroded soils, we find in the southern Piedmont region of Virginia, 
Drought is an issue that we face year in and year out. Um, and, and that's, I want to talk a little bit about corn and sorghum and, and kind of how they fit together into production systems. And, and just when I thought I did something original, I was getting ready for this talk and I, I came across this on Google Scholar site of all places. And this was a study that was done 125 years ago in Kansas. And, uh, and I did almost the exact same study. So, so everything, I guess, goes in cycles. But, but in this particular study that was done in Kansas 125 years ago, they planted uh, corn and sorghum in alternate rows in the same row, corn only or sorghum only. And, and essentially what they found was that when sorghum had a, a better drought tolerance, as you would expect, and uh, when it was planted either in the same row or alternate rows, it increased the drought tolerance of that silage crop. And, and, uh, and I've done kind of the same thing What we did is look at um, corn and forage sorghum planted alone or in mixtures together in the same row. And uh, what we did was have a standard rate of corn seed, and then we planted either two, four, six, or eight pounds of forage sorghum mixed in that row with that corn. And then we planted forage sorghum alone at eight pounds per acre. And we used the, the one that um, was referred to earlier, AF7401, which is a burkitic dwarf. And uh, the really the nice thing about this variety is it doesn't get above about six feet tall. And um, the leaves have a, a shortened inner node between the leaves, so the, it's a very compressed plant, very leafy, very compressed. And the standability is outstanding of this plant. I think one of the Achilles heels of forage sorghums were they were so tall and lanky. And then we took uh, more lignin out of the plant with the BMR trait, and that's kind of a disaster waiting to happen if you get a 10 10 or 12 foot plant and you get a th summer thunder shower or a hurricane blowing off the coast, I mean, you can have a heck of a mess. Um, so this is a nice compressed plant. I have seen no lodging in it since I've been working with it for four or five years now. Um, and we see it had 100 pounds of nitrogen at seeding. And then we harvested it at the soft dough stage. So this is a picture, and in, in 2010, we had a pretty, pretty dry period during the summer months, and of course, that's when the, the people from the seed companies always come to look at your plots when they're kind of miserable and gray and all curled up, but, but they were nice enough to assure me that this is exactly what they wanted to see. And um, so we can see corn plants in, in, in there and forage sorghum plants in there, and the corn plants curled up before the forage sorghum plants did. And basically, that crop just sat there. It didn't grow. Didn't, the sorghum didn't die. The corn went reproductive, produced a tassel, no ear, of course, as you would expect, about this tall. But the sorghum just waited and waited, and it finally started to rain in August. And, um, and we were able to produce, you know, anywhere between 10 and uh, 12 tons of silage. And the, sor the corn alone plants produced around five tons of silage, and, and a portion of that was crabgrass. So, um, so adding as little as, as uh, four pounds of forage sorghum, you know, essentially doubled the yield of that silage crop. And we repeated the study in 2011, and we had better moisture, and, and we were producing up in that uh, 15 to 16 ton range for, uh, for the forage sorghum and corn mixtures. So adding as little as, as four to six pounds of forage sorghum can really increase the drought tolerance of that corn crop. The whole idea behind this was that in a good year, that corn would just come out and, and dominate that stand, and the forage sorghum would be a minor component. In a bad year, that forage sorghum will kind of fill in and, and give you some yield within that silage stand. One thing I forgot to mention, and I think it was on the slide, but, but this was late planted to simulate uh, a late planted silage crop that we commonly have in Virginia. So we planted this around a month later than the optimal corn planting time. Uh, this is some sorghum work that, that uh, Ford sorghum variety trials that we've done. And, and we've seeded these trials um, into a killed uh, cover crop, uh, no-till. And then we've uh, looked at several different varieties over the years. And, and I had four varieties the first year, and then the 
second year that we did this little trial, we had 12 varieties, and, it, and we'll show you some of that data. And uh, just a little bit, these are varieties from it, Advanta or Ulta seeds. And, um, and this is actually a variety from southern states. It's an older variety. It's a dwarf type variety, but pretty well suited for where we grow it. It's a, um, it's a conventional type. It's not a BMR type. So we, we saw in this trial um, yields again in the range of around, you know, 15 to, to 18, uh, 19 tons of um, adjusted silage yield. When we took these plants apart, so we took some of these plants and we actually dissected them into stalk, leaf, and head and looked at the yield contribution from each one of those components. What we found was these dwarf types, 7401 and 1515A, uh, uh, had a higher proportion of leaves, which is the green part of this bar, and, and a lower proportion of stalk in about the same yield uh, in the seed head. And, and that's kind of interesting data because Generally speaking, the more leaves we can have in a plant, the, the more nutritious that plant's going to be. And, um, and less lignified stock is going to be even better, too. And again, we did a, a sorghum trial in 2013. And uh, I don't have the, the A's and the B's above these bars, but the least significant difference was three tons per acre. And you can kind of do the math. That would be, say, uh, between uh, two of these ticks on here would be about three tons. Um, and again, we had some variation in yield. All the varieties yielded pretty well in 2013. We had an exceptional year for rainfall in 2013. Maybe a little too much rain, um, but the varieties all did well. And, and again, we're looking in this range of 15 to 20 tons of uh, adjusted yield. And this yellow bar right in the center is actually a, a control, which was a corn a hybrid that was supplied by... Um, Tracy Neff from King Agri Seeds wanted us to put in there. One of the differences between this year and the previous year was we varied nitrogen rate on these varieties. And uh, some of the varieties that were had a, a earlier maturity got a little bit less nitrogen than some of the ones that we thought would have a higher growth potential. We put a little bit more nitrogen on those trial on those particular varieties. Um, we also document a plant height at harvest, and uh, and the what, what I wanted to point out was that that some of the yields looked good for some of these other um, varieties, but but they were pushing ten feet or more tall, and um, and they had the BMR trait, and when you were harvesting those plots, I mean they were just a strong wind from being on the ground, and and that's important to note because. Yeah, you'd like to get a little bit more yield, but if you can't get that yield in the silo, then you're going to be in big trouble. And um, AF7401, again, was a, about six feet high, even in a really good, good growing year. So no lodging in that one. And, and, this is, um, and we had a little bit of lodging in some of these other plots, and um, especially the taller growing ones. But these ones that were dwarfs, uh, we essentially saw no lodging in. Um, one of the challenges is, is uh, you know, I really like the AF7401 cultivar, but it, it's a pretty full season cultivar. It's about 115 to 120 day uh, growing season, and that's in a good year. The, the thing to remember about these um, forage sorghums is that if you get into a drought period in the middle of the summertime and growth stops for two weeks, you're essentially extending your growing season by two weeks on the end because they, they stop and they wait for that rain, which is a good thing, but, but they're going to take longer to finish out in that fall. So this was, um, this was the uh, days to harvest, and the harvest was done at the soft dough stage for the different varieties. And, and some of these varieties, like AF7401, you know we're um, over 120 days to the soft dough stage. And when we harvested these yield trials, a lot of yield trials will just harvest one date, we actually went in and, and documented the, the growth stage and harvested at the soft dough stage. In, in the soft dough stage in forage sorghum, if you've never worked with that, it's pretty tight. You, you go from milk to soft dough to something that's too hard to be digested in the animal in a matter of days. So you really have to be on top of it to, to keep it from getting uh, that seed from getting too hard. 
Um, we've also done a little bit of work with uh, seeding and, and nitrogen rate study. And um, I'll just show you a, a little bit of data. This is the seeding rate averaged over nitrogen rate for this trial. And um, the seeding rates ranged from 25,000 up to 175,000 seeds per acre. And that roughly equates to 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 pounds of forage sorghum per acre. And this is AF7401. And as you can see, once you get into this four to six pound range of, of seed, you're really not getting any, any uh, boost in yield by adding more seed to that. And, and we saw that in the second year too, and I'll show you that. One of the interesting things that I wanted to show you was that in 2012, we had a kind of a unique year. Um, we had really good early growing conditions for our corn silage crop. And then right as that plant was going reproductive and it was shedding pollen, and uh, fertilizing the uh, ear of the corn, we had a week of extremely high temperatures and uh, a dry period. And essentially what happened was we ended up with a corn silage crop with no ear on it. And, and that happens from time to time in, in Virginia when we get that, that conditions during pollination. And uh, so essentially our corn, average for our corn silage trial was about just over six tons adjusted yield per acre. And uh, in this crop was planted a month later and uh, had adjusted yields of around 16 tons per acre. This was the impact of uh, seeding rate in 2013. Not, not too much. We had no significant differences once we got above two pounds of, of seed within this trial. So I think if you're in that four pound range for uh, seed, you're going to be in pretty good shape with AF7401. This was the impact of nitrogen rate. We had no nitrogen response in 2012. I don't know why. And I'll just leave it at that. There was soil available nitrogen. Sometimes that just happens. We did the same trial a year later, and, uh, and we got a nice response to nitrogen in that trial. Stepwise response up to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre in, in, uh, in 2013. You know, it was a little bit drier, but we had adequate moisture. So I don't think it was moisture limited. Yeah, it was just, there was some reason in that particular field that we chose, there was a lot of soil available nitrogen. I, I don't know why. All right, this is kind of, and I see Chad stood up there, so I need to get off the stage here. But this was a, a summary paper that was, a review paper that was in Forage and Grazing Lands that kind of summarized dairy cow performance on uh, sorghum silage. and. Uh, they put together all the studies that they could find. And when everything was said and done, what they found was that when they compared corn silage and a BMR forage sorghum, that uh, pounds of milk per day were equal in all except one case. Equal or higher with, with BMR forage sorghum in all except one case. And that's really been the Achilles heel of forage sorghums is that it, the cows have not milked as well off of forage sorghums. And I think the BMR, new BMR varieties really can change the way we think about incorporating these uh, forage sorghum species into um, forage production systems for dairies. All right, how am I, do I have one minute left, Jen? Two minutes, okay. Just wanted to sit down and, and and I sat down and took our, our budgets in Virginia, and these are available online, and I, and I did them for forage sorghum and for corn. And um, when we had uh, equal yield, 15 ton for corn and sorghum, um, I didn't find a big cost savings difference per ton of, of sorghum, $38 per ton total cost versus 42. And, and I know a lot of people say there's a big difference, but, but you, you do save money on seed, and you save money on a little bit less nitrogen, but you know, a lot of the costs are the same between forage sorghum and corn. All the harvest costs are the same, the planting costs and so forth. Um, so I didn't see a big difference. I think where you will see a cost difference is when you get into a really dry year because you're no longer spreading the cost of corn out over 15 tons, you're spreading it out over eight or 10 tons when you can sp still spread that cost of the forage sorghum over uh, you know, 14 or 16 tons. And that's when I think you see a big total cost difference in a dry year. So where does it fit into silage systems? And I think this will be my last slide. Um, I don't think it's going to replace corn, and I don't think it should replace corn in silage systems. Um, 
especially if you're in an area where you have good soils and you've got good corn silage growing conditions in most years, I think you should just keep on growing corn silage. Um, maybe in mixtures with corn as an a insurance mechanism for drought years. Probably the best fit is on droughty soils um, that are marginal for corn silage production. I think that's where it makes the most sense to use these forage sorghums at. And maybe in arid regions or regions that are prone to short-term drought stress may be a good fit. And delayed or late silage planting. So for some reason you get delayed in your silage planting, you may be better to come in with a uh, forage sorghum versus a corn if it's a late planting. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you. And uh, is there any questions I can answer while we get switched over? All on the same day, and um, and some were, and there were and we have the height data, and some were taller than others. We targeted about 40 inches for our first harvest, and then every other harvest was made the same number of days from that first harvest. Was there a reordering? When you showed the initial harvest, was there a change when you took a look at subsequent harvests, or I'm sure there was, I mean, you can hardly have 30 varieties in the trial and not have some reordering, reordering of subsequent harvests. But the, the graphs that I showed you that were kind of split into four pieces were averages for the entire growing season. So. How did you mechanically plant your mixture of corn and corn? <laughs> That's a good question. And, um, and we used a cone, cone seeder. It was a research type planter. So. And, and when we initially, when I initially conceived that study, I called our ag engineer and I said, I, I don't know how we're going to plant this, but he said, just go ahead and do it and see if it works, then I'll figure out a way to plant it. So. I think it'll work through an insecticide. I think so, yeah. Back on your nitrogen slide for 2012. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There was a pretty pretty linear response to nitrogen in, in twenty thirteen, but growth was not limited by moisture in that year for sure. You know, we didn't we didn't measure them, but I would suspect no because the because there was no drought on that forage sorghum at all. I still have the samples though. I could test some of the higher nitrogen rates. In that three year data, Chris, did you have different levels of digestibility for the climatic differences? Cause difference in digestibility just curious. Um I have to go back and look at the weather data. 2010 was certainly, we had some, some fairly uh, extended dry periods in 2010. 2009 was pretty much an average year. 2011, I think, was pretty much an average year. So, but, well, but average year means that we do have some, some short-term drought periods. Lower rain will reduce digestibility or? <laughs> I don't know, Tom. It's kind of interesting. In drought years, you know, a lot of dairy producers will say that the cows actually milk pretty good off of drought stress corn. So, yeah, all right. That was a good discussion. Yeah. One more